Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back from a, our little brief break there. My name is Chris Rialli. I'm an assistant professor of music industry at Ramapo College in New Jersey. Um, and I just want to give another shout out for that awesome session by Will and Ralph. That was amazing. A lot of, lot of things to think about. And uh, as Scott typed in the chat, it's got a lot of good be in our minds for quite some time for this whole summer, thinking about all those all those things to bring to our classes in the, in the fall. Um, I'm going to be the moderator for this uh, next coming session, which is um, industry, ten, industry Trends and Trop Topics. Um, we've got four um, papers I'm going to talk about. Um, and I'm going to, um, kind of like what Scott did this morning, I'm going to bring in each individual presenter um, one at a time, and we'll talk for about maybe seven minutes or so about their work. Um, and if there's any questions, um, feel free to type away in the chat and they will make their way to me and I'll be glad to ask the presenters. And, um, and if there's time at the end, we'll bring everyone back and have a, we can have a, a quick dialogue. Um, my first uh, guest um, paper we're going to talk about today is Dan Hodges. So Dan um, is now a lecturer at, um, at Belmont University, but before that, he's had extensive history working for BMG, um, Rick Hall's Fame Music, Give It Up for Alabama, um, and uh, Murrah Music. And his paper is called Integration resistance in the acquisition of the Nashville publishing companies by international firms. So I want to bring, I want to bring um, Dan on camera and then um, have a little chat about his, his research. Dan, are you there? I'm here. Yeah, awesome. Hey, welcome. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. Hi. Um, Hi, everyone. So, um, so I just want to give you just a, how did you arrive at this topic? That's my, my first question to you. Well, it, it happened. Uh, this was actually the topic of my dissertation. I finished my uh, DBA last year at Liberty University. And after being a publisher for 30 years in the Nashville community, I kind of wanted to uh, my my DBA was in international business. And I kind of wanted to relate that in some way to the music industry. Um, so. Basically, what I what I noticed is, you know, being a 30 year publisher in the Nashville market, uh, I've noticed a lot of companies, multinationals coming into the market and, and acquiring uh, a lot of the small independent publishing companies. And I was curious kind of what effect that's happening. Uh, not just I mean, we we've all kind of seen the effect on Music Road where these companies that are based in small houses up and down 16th and 17th Avenue are those 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 are going away. Uh, so now you see these office buildings springing up with the publishing companies. Some are moving off the row. Some are going downtown. Uh, so I wanted to see what effect that had on employees and in the creative industry as well on the people, uh, kind of an organizational behavior type perspective on it. Uh, so that's what I did. Awesome. So, you know, so yeah, throughout your presentation, you, uh, several times you referenced um, Nashville culture, Nashville market. Um, could you speak a little bit more about that for people who may be not familiar with what with, with exactly what you mean by those two? I mean, there's similar frame, but similar uh, phrases, but they're not exactly the same thing. Right. Well, it, you know, similar to many different industries, you know, Nashville is a business cluster. So what that means is there's a hub, which is kind of your uh, in a business cluster, maybe a main business and then other smaller businesses will center themselves around that main business to take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, so in Nashville, we have, you know, multiple hubs. We have your major labels here. Um, so uh, can you repeat that question real quick? I think I got oh, ahead of myself. No I, I would, no, I was just I just wanted you to clarify. So, you know, you use the phrases national market and, okay. um, and national culture. Right. So as a result of being a business cluster, uh, clusters have a unique culture where businesses will, um, even though they're competitors, they kind of work together. So an example in Nashville would be, let's say you have two music publishing companies that have staffs of songwriters and one writer from each company, they write a song together. Well, now you have two companies that are competitors, but they're actually working and trying to place that song um, together. So they're working kind of in mutual benefit, even though they're competitors and they're based here because they're the hubs or the major labels that are based in this market. Uh, so that that type of perspective kind of creates a culture in this market to where it's a small family style environment. It's a uh, the publishing company is. They're very service oriented where they cultivate their songwriters, they network their songwriters, develop them, um, and they cooperate together. The different companies, the competitors will cooperate with each other. Yeah. So, I mean, thank you. Because, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, struck, struck me in your presentation was like, you're basically talking about the resistance at, the, at, these, at these smaller mom and pop 
uh, facilities, for lack of a better phrase, basically it's a resistance to, to like to, to globalization and and corporatization. Is is that kind of kind of what you're? I mean, I don't know. Actually, resistance might be might, might be too strong a word, oh. but. Uh, a push back. That may be a little, I mean, that's more of a general broad aspect, you know, any kind of acquisition, you know, employees always are resistant to change. So that's always going to occur, occur according to the research. Uh, but I wanted to see if there was any kind of unique resistance in Nashville. And, and that's kind of what I found by, by my interview process and going through the, um, the research was, you know, I wrote these down here. You know, there's obviously the, the normal anxiety and stress that goes along with your company being acquired by another company. Um, but one of the, some of the things that weren't considered uh, was the emotions of the employees going through sure. that process, um, consideration of the local environment. You know, these companies that are moving in were really just coming in to purchase catalogs for income streams, and they weren't really concerned about cultivating and servicing songwriters and developing people um, in the industry. Um, so we found a lot of things uh, through that. Yeah, you know, um, it's, uh, like some of the things you're saying now, and, and I'm just linking, I'm linking back in my memory to like some of the things that Will just talked about, basically like, the, the, the whole acquisition market of just building up, building up catalog for obviously for, you know, financial stake, but also for like, Hey, look, look who we have in our catalog now. And, you know, and I'm thinking back to my own research, which is actually on Muscle Shoals and, you know, did some research oh. on McCall stuff. And, you know, when he sold his couple catalogs, he was really concerned about who's going to buy this catalog. And are they, they going to service these, these songwriters and these songs, or are they just going to put it as a feather in their cap? Um, you know that was that was very much a concern of his, and, I, and obviously, you know, these are these are although these are small small companies that they're worth tens of some of them are worth tens of millions of dollars because of, because of the acquisitions that, that other, well, the 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 catalog they already have. Right. So, kind of what you ended up seeing was you had songwriters that wrote for these small companies that are in a house environment where their um, their boss is across the hall in what would be the living room of the house, and they're in a writer room in there, and they're all in the same building. They're you know, hanging out at the coffee pot in the morning. And now they're all of a sudden acquired by this big multinational firm and they're in an office building um, off the row and it's a sterile environment. It's not a house environment. It's, you know, all glass. The staff's all working in cubicles in a middle area. Uh, it loses that family atmosphere, that, that, that cultivating culture. And in many cases, uh, I found that your songwriters, your creative people weren't even allowed without key card access into the part of the building that had the staff, the management wow. staff. Interesting. So that was a real difference in how their day to day and what they were used to. And it was a big um, reason for their um, anxiety and stress. Sure. Now, you said, as I know, at least for what you talked about, you, you, you interviewed 16 people um, for this portion of the study. I'm assuming you, did you interview more people beyond the 16 or was that just for this? Um, was that for this? 16? For this particular study, it was just 16. So yeah, and, and these and those were primarily people who work. They were, they, they were staff or were they songwriters, a mixture of staff and songwriters or? They were a mix of songwriters and staff, some uh, people that ran the companies that were acquired. So basically every individual that was interviewed worked for a small publisher in some capacity before they were acquired by an international firm or multinational firm. They survived the process and they worked for the multinational firm for a period afterwards. Um, and I even had a couple of folks that uh, I interviewed that are running some of the major uh, publishers here in town. I, the uh, interviews were confidential, so I can't say who they were. Yeah, but, of course. Uh, but it was very exciting to get access to some of uh, some of those people. Now, you know, you, you, I know you mentioned, uh, and I appreciate that you, you know you talk about sort of the the mental stress that get that's uh, you know um, anxiety. So, and some of you mentioned that a lot of these interview, interviews were conducted via Zoom. So clearly, this was this was taking place. These acquisitions were taking place, or had taken place, and now you're following up through this pandemic, which may be even further alienating you know, um, the, some of the employees from, from this, this, this family culture to like, oh, now I'm working for this corporate conglomerate and like, I'm, my boss is somewhere and I'm, I'm, I'm in my living room freaking out. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Like, I mean, could you, do you want to speak a little bit, little more about that, about the, I mean, cause obviously the, 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 the mental health toll on, from the pandemic has been, it's been a forefront on a lot of people's mind, especially in the industry as well. Yeah. You know, when I, my, my research wasn't really involved with, um, exploring the pandemic aspect i was okay. kind of i was trying to explore more the international the aspect of being acquired by the international and that you know that had a huge effect on the morale of employees and uh their feeling you know one of the things that they saw as well that uh in a few instances some of the uh workers 
um, actually had their managers go with them in the acquisition. And in those cases, it was a positive, a big positive to have that manager that you already had a good relationship with and um, that was cultivating those people. Uh, so that was a, a positive in some instances. And one of the uh, participants that I interviewed as well that was running the, one of the major companies, his company was acquired by one of the majors, his small company that he ran that was very successful and what was really interesting, he kind of served as my outlier in the whole uh, project, is he was asked by his uh, guy, the head guy in New York of his company to um, bring that small company culture to the international firm, to their office in, in, here in Nashville. And so far, he's done that successfully. And it was really interesting. He's kept that small company feel. He emails his employees and songwriters every day, encouraging words. And he's focused on that service and cultivation of his employees and his workers and his songwriters. And it's been really a, a positive experience. And one of my other participants is actually one of his songwriters that has been a part of that process. And he, he didn't feel like he'd had too much of a loss in job satisfaction or productivity. Uh, and the findings th that I found at the end were, you know, I was kind of surprised about one aspect. I knew that we'd have a decline in job satisfaction. I kind of figured that and assumed that would happen through this process. Um, but I also thought that we'd have a decline in productivity. And, uh, and most of the research told me in my literature review um, portion that I would have a decline in productivity through, would see a decline in productivity through acquisition and integration. But it was actually the opposite in this case. And I think, you know, it stemmed from uh, these songwriters acquired by the other firm. They felt like they had to prove themselves. So they actually worked harder in, sure. in the new situation. Um, plus, uh, they thought there were going to be more opportunities in that situation. So they worked harder towards those opportunities. Most of them didn't really pan out. Uh, and in the long run, that increase in productivity um, served to give them less job satisfaction as well because they were working harder and they felt like they were on their own and they didn't have people supporting them or the company supporting them. So that was kind of a surprise uh, result that I had through the process. Um, I guess one last question. So what are what are some of the lessons we can impart to our to to, to our colleagues here on this on, on you know on the conference here? Like you know what are, what are, what are things we should be looking out for? You know, or what what can we keep, what can we teach students? From you know, from from you know, or what can we share with you know? Yeah. I, I, uh, well, what we can teach, you know, I think overall one of the 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 things that I've hoped people would see through this research would be companies uh, or individuals coming in to try to acquire companies in this market and think, wow, I need to really you know look at this and and think how can I be most success successful here. And not just look at the bottom line, but look at the long term and how this is going to affect my employees and my songwriters. And, um, and you know, I'd hope students would understand that as well. You know, that that culture, hopefully they would see the culture in Nashville that we're talking about here and uh, what to take into account. Because maybe a student someday will be working for that multinational and have to venture into Nashville. And uh, it'd be good if they kind of understood the market. Right. Thank you. You know, and, and I know you, you posed some excellent follow up questions to, you know, to your own research, like obviously speaking, speaking to the, some of the multinationals and saying, hey, did this pan out for you? Like, did, did, did it did it did what you expect actually happen? Or was there, you know, so again, so I look forward to hearing if there's any follow up research on that. I would like to further, you know, explore that. And that's one of my plans here in the future. So. Yeah, we look, I look forward to hearing that. So I mean, again, so those of you who haven't, if I haven't, haven't had the opportunity to go to, to, to go view um, Dan's. Um, really, really informative video. Please go do so. So integration resistance in the acquisition of Nashville publishing companies by international firms. So thank you, Dan, for your time. Stick, stick around. We'll be back. We'll get back to you in a second. Okay. Um, Thanks for having I'd me. Like to bring, yeah, of course. Um, I'd like to pivot to our next, our next presenter. Um, Frizina Morris um, has been in the music business for quite some time, uh, about 15 years, and she's currently a PhD student. I'm just going to read the initials because I can't pronounce these words. It's E-L-T-L. Um, so, and her paper is titled, um, what's knowledge management, what's knowledge got, quoting, riffing, riffing on Tina Turner, what's knowledge management got to do with it? The secrets of industry respected music business degrees. So, Christina, welcome. You work, and you're coming to us live from, uh, Hungary, right? Or is it, um, is at the moment, at? I, I, at the moment I'm in London, I'm doing a traineeship oh. at, at BPI because I'm sponsoring uh. my research in the UK. So, yeah. Ah, 
Well, welcome from London. Um, so I, I get a similar question that I asked Dan. Um, how did you arrive at this topic? Um, there were three different uh, stories. The first one was in 2007 when I was a promoter back in Budapest. And I noticed that one of my colleagues was able to cross a huge crowd when he wanted to go into the backstage, go, go backstage. Uh, and I noticed that it's some sort of a skill or intelligence that he has that some people have and some people don't have. The other thing is uh, when I started teaching and in my own private school, I realized while I was teaching that I didn't have a current example that I, I could give. So because I, I finished working as a manager years before that because, because of my educational uh, job. And the third thing was a debate in Vienna, in Vienna at the Vienna Music Business Research Days because there's a European conference. And there was a debate between um, educators whether music business courses should train people to meet the industry needs or the future trends. So, and, and I saw that, you know, and, and I also did a music management degree in London myself. And I could see that the knowledge didn't, um, so in some aspect, I didn't know much about the labor market and the industry itself when I graduated. So for example, I didn't know the venues in London in order to organize concerts for bands I, I would like to work with. So that's why I realized that there must be some sort of a special knowledge that these industry professionals possess. So these were the three, three or four stories. Oh, we forget to put on video. Sorry, I, I did, I'm not sure if that was my internet. It got frozen there for a second, so I, yeah, I lost that was, last it bit. Was. Of... It was, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah. So you know, part of research is looking at like, um, you know, what skill sets can educators teach. It, uh, um, you know, teach some student, teach industry students, and what, like, and there was a you talk about tacit knowledge. So, I guess, I guess, my, my question, my first question to you is, um, explain. You talk a lot about tacit knowledge, um, yeah. you know, and, and and how that, and how and why that's important into into music management and 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 the and the business of music. Yeah, uh, tacit knowledge is a special kind of knowledge that was um, that was. Um, so the most famous book about tacit knowledge is, was written by a Hungarian called Michael Polanyi, who lived in London. So I'm very, very happy that I can deal with a topic like that. And tacit knowledge is basically about the knowledge that people have who work in practice. So it includes judgment, it includes skills, it includes industry or professional uh, rules that one can acquire while working with others. So this is this is something that all industry professional on the all industry professionals have, but it's very hard to articulate because, it, as as Michael Polanyi said, we know then we know more than we can tell. So we have this knowledge. This is tacit. That's that's why he called it tacit knowledge, and it can be compared to codified knowledge. This is the knowledge that we can tell about, that we can put in books, or we can, you know, analyze. So this is a very important aspect because what employers look for when it comes to an employee, it can be this sort of tacit knowledge that whether they are able to do the work or not. And there's a sociologist uh, called Alexander Frenet who wrote he, uh, his PhD about music business internships. And he also published articles about that. And in his article, he refers to music industry professionals that he interviewed during his PhD process. And they all said that they want to somehow measure the level of knowledge or this sort of tacit knowledge that these people who they employ as an intern have, because then they can decide whether they are able to do the job or not. And my paper is basically about how tacit knowledge is linked to expertise that these industry professionals have, what sort of contact or relationship it has with um, becoming an, uh, an employee or a successful professional, and what sort of uh, relationship tacit knowledge has with um, 
practical intelligence, and it's based on a uh, theory of an American psychologist uh, called Robert Sternberg. Thank you. Uh, you know, because so, you, you basically, in somewhere in the, in, the, in the middle of your presentation, you pose this question that kind of, I was, I was listening to it and it kind of threw me for a loop, it was like, is a music business course really essential to get into the music industry? And I was like, scratch, boop, hold on a second. And then you said, and if I'm not mistaken, you said no, uh, um, and, and, at least in the presentation or, or so. Could you or at least could you speak to that question? Yeah, so, yeah. I'm very lucky because I have a very good <laughs> UK supervisor called David Gill, who wrote about wrote articles about creative industry courses. And he was the person who organized the first Wailers gig, the, the band of Bob Marley in the UK. OK. And he wrote an article about uh, creative industries and how people get get into uh, the sector and what he wrote that there are three different routes into the in industry the networking routes when you find people who could hire you or help you to find contacts the industry accredited route right? for example internship or the academic route that you can choose to, uh, to do or gain a degree but in case of Hungary for example before I started teaching music business education at a higher education level there wasn't any courses like that so, and for the, the same with Slovakia and Czech Republic is just starting out. So in case of countries where music industry is huge, they do have music business courses. But we, we can see that, for example, the manager of the Beatles didn't have any qualifications. Sure. So you, you can still work in the industry without qualifications. So what, for example, Toby Bennett wrote about, and he did a very good um, research for UK music. It was sponsored by UK music, but uh, the trade body in the United Kingdom, but it was published by King's College. And he could also talk to industry professionals and course leaders. And what his uh, conclusion was that uh, these courses in case of the UK, some of them, I'm not saying that all, I don't want to generalize, it's very important, don't give any benefits and advantage for students so they are not respected. That's why I got into the question, what's the matter sure. with, with that and what's happening? And I, I, I'm also explaining, and I, last year I had a presentation at MIA as well, and, and I was talking about the different aspects that German, US and UK courses have. So it has something to do with tacit knowledge as well and how they see education and vocational qualifications. Sure. I mean, uh, I guess one last thing before we move on. So, you know, in, in the U.S., so many uh, internships, you can't so many. You can't get an internship unless you unless you come from a college, an accredited college. Um, it's, and it's and so. Right. So, so it is. So you have like, you know, so many large firms, even small firms like, sorry, we're not going to talk to you. And we're not going to even look at your look at your application unless you're coming from a, a, a credit. And it's a, it's a way to vet students for the company. And also, you know, and, 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 and you know, it, it, um, so it's, it's very it's a slightly different model here in the U.S. where, you know, where that doesn't mean that the class they're taking make them ideal candidates. But the, but but the companies, but a lot of these companies have both large and small have sort of put the the training back onto the briefly put the put the training back onto the colleges and universities. Yeah, that that's that's why I'm comparing in my PhD. That's why I'm yeah. comparing the German, the US, and the UK approach. Because, for example, as far as I know, I'm not sure. I still have to write a chapter about that. But the music business education in the US started in the 70s. In the right. UK, it was 1999. So almost 30 years of delay. So, you know, and there's a difference between the approaches because in case of the UK, there are several courses which do not do not have any vocational output. Right. So this, yes, you know, the difference, uh, the difference lie in details. So it lies in details. Yeah. So that's why it's important. Um, great, thank you. Uh, for the, um, I encourage everyone to go take a listen, uh, take a moment to go to go listen to her paper, um, uh, which is "What's Knowledge Management Got to Do with It: The Secrets of Industry Respected Music Business Degrees," which is on the uh, streaming on the on the, the uh, um, our summit site. Um, thank you, Pazina. Um, stick around; I'll be back. I'll get back to you in a second. I'd like to next bring up uh, John Alet, um, who is an assistant professor at Middle Tennessee State and also an uh, an attorney, music industry attorney. Um, and his paper was called how record labels and music publishers deal with copyright issues. And, and specifically, um, John was talking about um, the termination of transfer process. So John, are you, are you with us here? I'm here. All right, hey, welcome. Um, wow, let's get a lot of books there, wow. Yeah, yeah, that's my own personal <laughs> pretend library. I virtually like, read all of them. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like Armin's library too. It's very impressive. So yeah. um, like, welcome, welcome to the, uh, to the, to, to the summit. Um, so, um, so you talk about the transfer of, uh, of termination process 
Um, so um, I'm not going to ask you to explain that because you do it really well in, in your paper. Um, but I want to just ask you a, a straight-ahead question. In your experience as, as an attorney, um, you know, and in your, in, your, in your business experience, how often do songwriters or artists actually submit these type of requests? Like, how, is this a common thing? Is it a- oh, yeah, it, it happens pretty frequently. Uh, and, you know, what we've seen, and we've seen this kind of playing out in, you know, just live in front of us, the record labels take a very different approach to the publishers because the record labels want to argue that it's a work made for hire. Right. Um, but it happens very frequently. Yeah, I mean, you referenced a couple a couple of cases where the where the 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 work for hire defense, I guess, is is has yet to be has yet to be codified by by any by any uh, court. Um, you know, and, and obviously there's been debates about this whether whether it works whether it songs or works for hires. Um, I, you know, years ago that that was there there's a provision you know that was struck down by a lot of songwriters. Um, but I guess I didn't realize it was still being played out that that's the basically the, the defense of record label saying nope, it's a work for hire, so you can't transfer, you can't terminate it, we own it forever. Yeah, so so the rec- the the songs typically when we're talking about songwriters and publishers, those are generally not going to be a work for hire, right? Because just the arrangement that they have, uh, unless it's written specifically for a movie or a television commercial or a TV show, that's not going to be a work for hire and is clearly subject to the termination right. But um, the the sound recording side of it, um, the record labels, if if you're familiar with record contracts, they they put into the contract that. The sound recordings are specially ordered or commissioned works as a contribution to a collective work. Try to make them a work for hire. As you referenced, Congress at one point many years ago added sound recordings to what can be a work made for hire. And then a couple of years later, took it out. Right. Um, So there's just kind of this ongoing debate. Are sound recordings eligible for that work for hire designation? And record labels clearly do not want to litigate this. (laughs) <laughs> there have been several lawsuits that have been filed and have been settled out of court. And a lot of times you, you might hear about the filing. Um, but most of the time, what will happen based on conversations I've had with lawyers at record labels is they get the termination notice. They immediately object to it on the grounds that it's a work made for hire. So the, the sound recordings aren't eligible. And then they start to negotiate. Yeah, so I mean, I so I, a follow up question I had, um, which you, well, thank you for that perfect lead in. Well, so how 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 often are, are songwriters are successful in 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 winning these type of requests? You know, I mean, if you even if you're speaking anecdotally, well, I think if it's a significant sound recording, um, the the negotiation is going to go fairly well in that they'll get offered a much better deal, probably get some kind of either a recoupable advance or just a non recoupable payment. Uh, so that the label can retain the rights. Right. I'm um, actually, someone, someone actually, I, I got a question for you from the audience. And it says, uh, um, oh, no, I'm sorry, wrong person. That's for Dan. I'll get back to you. Sorry, Jen. Um, I read the name wrong. Um, so, because obviously, you know, because this, this uh, what happens? So, you know, I, I'm a songwriter. I file for a termination of transfer. And then it can lead to some acrimonious things, right? I mean, clearly the significant lawsuits can happen. And like, you know, I, I'm assuming that the, the relationship between the artist and the label it can really go sour very quickly. Um, yeah, but typically at this stage, the relationship is over. Right. Because okay. it's 35 years, usually after publication, could be 40 years from the signing of the document um, uh, or, or 35 years from the grant or 40 years from publication. Got that a little backwards. But so it's you're typically 35 years out. So there really isn't a relationship now. There aren't very many artists who stay with the same label for 35 years. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Thank you. Thank you. So, for yeah, it. the relationship's over. Um, it probably went sour at some point because it's an artist and a record label. <laughs> right. The artists ultimately come to hate their record labels in almost every single circumstance. <laughs> so, yeah, the relationship is no good. Um, and then it's a matter of does the artist have enough money to sustain a lawsuit? And is the record label and, and our, is the record label going to actually let it go to court, which we just we don't see that happening. Um, the most recent thing that's happened with the, the, the weights versus UMG case is they filed a motion to certify it as a class action lawsuit. Right. And this that lawsuit's been pending 
it seems like for two years now. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I looked it up the other day. Yeah, and the, the last thing, the last news about it was two years ago. It was October of 2020. I think was the last time someone that one of the there was a, a briefing about yeah, it. Nothing significant has happened, but a month or two ago, they filed a motion to certify it as a class action lawsuit. Right. Which is sort of how they filed it anyway. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, a, a bunch of people joined it. So right. um, I guess very briefly, the, the one thing that was really fascinating to me about your presentation was that what publishers decide, they only register the, what, what the phrase you used was the, 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 important, the important songs. songs yeah, right? yeah that so, was a shocker to me. Um, yeah, so, I yeah, came so, up, I was negotiating an admin deal with one of the major publishers. And typically I'll put in, you have to register it within three months of initial publication just to kind of preserve all the rights. And they never really agree to do that because someone will screw up and then they'll be in breach. But that led to the conversation of, well, we only register the important songs. I thought, surely not everybody is doing this. So I called the other majors and one out of the other two majors said, yeah, that's what we do. We register the important songs. And I said, well, how do you know when a song is important? <laughs> Because when it's first published, you know, as, as it, I would imagine everybody knows, the, the date of first publication, the song has earned zero dollars. Right. You don't know until a few months down the road until to see how much it's going to be earning or something. Or it could be years, right? It could, it yeah. could be years. Yeah. And, as, right. as you, and then as you point out, like you then you lose, like if you wait too long, a, a song that's in a catalog song that all of a sudden becomes a hit. Then you've lost out the window, and you, you, right. you, you could. You, I, there's there are other legal ramifications of not right. registering it immediately. The right to statutory damages and attorneys' fees. You've only got prior to infringement or within three months of initial publication. The kind of prima facie evidence that the certificate provides uh, as evidence of ownership, if it's not registered within five years of initial publication. But yeah. So I just asked, how do you do it? And they said, well, we just kind of look at who's releasing it, what kind of marketing money's behind it. And if we don't think it's going to do anything, we don't register it right away. If it takes off, we'll go and register it. Wow. But by that point, you may have lost some rights. And right. that just kind of shocked me because as someone who was responsible for registering the copyrights many, many years ago at a music publisher, it was, you know, we were trying to register every single thing within a month or two of initial publication. And yeah. now it's just become more casual. And part of it, they told me, is with social media, and with streaming services, it's it's kind of difficult to track everything. And right. quite frankly, the realities of streaming are someone releases a song. And that might be the first use of the song. It might be the one we would otherwise register. But if it's only going to make 37 cents, should we spend the time and the money sure. to register the copyright? Yeah. So. Well, thank you. We, we, I'm, we're out of time for, for you right now because I need to move on to my last presentation. So John, John Allett's uh, presentation, how record labels... And music publishers deal with copyright issues, like a very, very concise dive into uh, into uh, into the to the uh, idea of, uh, or behind the process behind the termin termination of transfer, transfer process. So, again, I encourage everyone to go take a look at it. Um, thank you, John. Thank you. Um, and so bring up our last guests, um, Brian Cullinan and Kim Wengler. Um, so they're both um, at App Appalachian State. And Brian um, is the lead researcher, I guess, on this. I could use that phrase. And he's an instructor um, at App State. And, um, and Kim, we just we did, had, had her introduction to her a few minutes ago. She's an associate professor and director of music industry studies. And the paper they're going to talk about today is the past, present, and future influence of popular culture on the music industry. So let's welcome uh, Brian and Kim. Come on. on Thank soon. you, Chris. Thank You're you. welcome. Um, so um, I was I was really fascinated by, by the presentation um, because, like, I, I'm – as a historian, I'm always trying to teach my students like um, things that happen in, th in the future ha already happen in the past. And, and Will's example is that it's basically when I, it's the same thing happening over and over again. So, um, and that was really fast. It was really obvious in, in the presentation that that's the history repeats itself. So, um, you know, so basically the, the presentation boils down to the idea that pop culture trends become drivers for musical, musical innovation. Um, and, and so explain why, why is that important to, to the business of music? Kim, I'll, I'll take this if you like. Sure. Uh, so, so I think uh, rewinding a bit, when I was at uh, Sony Music years ago, um, we had a quarterly meeting uh, that was based upon trends. And you know, I, one of the things that sticks in my mind about one of those meetings was um, we were we were running through some Gen Y stuff and uh, aspirational uh, jobs, names, other things, and they said, "Who do you respect uh, the most? What what would you what would you do? Uh, you know, who do you want to be in twenty years?" And I remember uh, the number two answer was Donald Trump. 
on that, uh, you know, this was, this is about 20 years ago or so. And I remember that stuck with me because I thought, wow, it kind of came out of nowhere. I didn't know the show was that popular. It was, and this is among Gen Y and they were really, uh, this is when they were tweens and it was repeating sort of probably what they were hearing in their living rooms, right. From their parents and other people. Um, I, 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 when we had those quarterly meetings, it was really important for us to kind of take a, a step outside of what it was that we were doing and hear information like that, that we wouldn't be privy to otherwise. We were buried in the business of doing music and we weren't buried in the business of trends. We weren't in the lives of our customers. So in that moment, we were in the living room with our customer. We we're in the living room with those, with those Gen Y kids, with their parents. We were hearing things that perhaps that we didn't hear before and was informing us about what our customers were doing outside of listening to music. And to the extent that that informs what music becomes and kind of serves as a cradle in which you know music can grow, a pop culture cradle in which things happen, um, it was important for us to hear that. And I realized after talking to some friends in the business that that no longer really happens. That, you know, way uh, 20 years ago when we were living off the fat of land and we could have those directors of, you know, market intelligence that could come in and give auditorium speeches, it was great. But we, the business doesn't really have that anymore. And, uh, you know, when I was facing students and they were asking the questions, what it is, you know, what is it that I need to be looking at um, other than music to find out what the direction of music is going to be in, in five months, five years, um, you know, to inform my career or the choices that I'm making right now? It's like, you know, I thought to myself, this is it's very important that we reintroduce that to the business. It's missing and it's important. Yeah, so that leads into my follow, follow up question. So, like, how do you integrate this into the classroom? Like, so. Other than telling your students, hey, read these reports, you know, watch, follow trends on TikTok. I mean, how do like because it's always we're always behind the times in some ways, you know. Um, so h- how do you how do you get your students to do to do this work or, or to get involved in this? Kim, if I'll you want take to take this one. Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so I was looking at all of the reports here and putting them together and thinking that after doing this research with Brian and, and getting more involved in how to find out trends. Um, I was thinking I would have students do assignments. My students in a couple of different classes work with local bands and I would have them read a couple of these reports and pick one of the trending topics and see if there was some aspect of that that they could work into a project with their bands, which still is following the past, but at least getting them thinking about uh, looking at trends in a very real way where they're actually working with a local band and showing the band what some of the trends are. Uh, I think that will better help them think about the trends of the past and extrapolate that into how they're going to think about what's coming next. Can you, do you have any success? I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, do you have any, um, do you have any success, success stories that you can share with the, with like, like where your students talk, worked with band and the band's like, oh, wow, that's cool. We did that. And then the band went off to do something, you know, even. <laughs> uh, actually, we just finished the research for ah. this <laughs> conference. So um, that's coming up in assignments in my music marketing class. Uh, come that time in the future that comes after summer vacation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Like the semester ended literally for us like last on Friday. So I was like, wait a minute, I'm not done yet. So yeah, I hear that. But the, you know, um, the, uh, Christopher, to ask your question, I did, you know, the gist of, the, of what got me started uh, down the line a little Nas X was, you know, where, where did that come from? Right. Um, right. Was it our, our songs? And this is to take nothing away from the artist and a brilliant song and a, you know, one of the smartest people in music right now that probably should be running any marketing department at a major label. Um, but you know, what, what was informing um, that kind of trend that came out of nowhere, you know, the, 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 the uh, you know, that, that, that cowboy trend, um, was there anything else that was going on? Was there anything else that was going on in culture that helped usher that in? Because it seems like a little bit of a hard sell for that to introduce itself just based upon a song. Right. And, and when you dig into it a little bit deeper, yeah, there was a lot that was going on. And you dig, you go back to layers of the onion and you see um, in the way that internet culture happens these days, in the way that those trends can be cradled and they can be uh, aided and abetted by other things that are going on, it helps grease the skids and it helps the cadence of those things. They happen a lot more quickly. And, and that's one of the problems that we have too in the music industry today is that I, I had the luxury of being able to have a quarterly meeting and get a snapshot of what was going on in culture, you know, quite a while back. 
Um, now you need to have a, about an every quarter hour meeting <laughs> to see what's going on, right? So if you don't have a dashboard in front of you, um, and that's really what this presentation is trying to get towards, like what, what's the dashboard that you can put in front of yourself as a music industry educator, as someone in the music industry, or as, as an aspiring uh, you know, entrant to the music business, what do you put in front of you to understand what's going on every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes? Because this stuff happens and then it goes away and the pace at which this happens is a lot quicker. The metronome is really pumping now. Yeah, and so, if I can add to that, actually, back to the student assignments, uh, I think based on this research, I will have students look into prior trends, like the cowboy trend of the <clears throat> 80s, uh, and then practice working with bands on current trends, and then talk about how do we spot the next trend that's coming. So it'll be kind of a three-prong approach of, looking in the history, practicing the here and now, and prognosticating for the future. Right. So I, I would encourage, so at the end, at the end of uh, Brian and Kim's um, paper, like there's a list of all these awesome resources. I have no idea that they're out there. And again, most of them are free. And just you can sort of download and see what the, 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 current, the current and future, the, the previous trends and the current trends are, are, that are happening. It's ideal for anybody teaching marketing classes. Um, really outstanding stuff. I'm afraid we were and out Chris, of time. Uh, yes. Chris, if I can just toss in here, sure. um, I'm putting all of those reports together and I'm going to get them into one document. And if anybody oh, okay. wants to email me, I would be happy to share that document that maybe some of us old schoolers would even print out and <laughs> get our yellow markers. Right. Uh, uh, I'm, with, I'm with you. But if right. anybody would like that compiled together, uh, they can just be in touch. Awesome. Again, I, we're out of time. I want to thank Dan and Fazina. Um, and John and Brian and Kim, if you want to come back on screen and just say thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. Four presentations, 40 minutes, time just goes by. There's so much stuff. So again, thank you for all everyone who presented. Um, I encourage all the, all the mayor participants to go and check out their presentations online on the website. And we'll, uh, we'll see you all soon. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks a lot.